Namco Bandai's Rolling Thunder trilogy, first originated in 1986 by the long since defunct Atari for the US. Known for its retro spy, espionage style of gameplay, this predates Shinobi by a year, despite the fact that many compare this franchise to the latter indicated ninja themed Sega classic, but I digress. Now onto our first choice, the original Rolling Thunder, reprogrammed by Arc System Works for the NES and the Famicom, released three years later by both Atari's short-lived Tengen subsidiary and Namco themselves, respectively. Welcome to the near year one and all. Before we get into this latest review, for everyone watching on YouTube, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Also, I'm dedicating this to Brookline Interactive Group, Somerville Media Center, Boston Open Screen, Weird Local Productions, Triple E Productions, Ian Bergeson, Matt Lister and the Stones, from Merrimack, Dover, and Ridge, New Hampshire individually, James Roll from Cinemassacre, Rod Weber, Lauren Pespisa, and Emery Galen of 2020 The Dumpster Fire fame, Jules Carosa from Gen Y Films and Goliath Post, Michael Dennis from Cathead Pictures, Darman Studios, Jay Shetty, Vid Chronicles, Illumiably, Supermission, psych to go E2 Animated Stories, Sudden Impact in Winthrop, Replay in Austin, High Energy Vintage in Somerville, Game Zone in Salem, Bitbar in the Crypt, not affiliated with each other but also in Salem, Bella, aka Girl with Yellow Spoon from LA, Kayla Antino, aka K Volta and Plum Drop 11 from Tewksbury, Nerd Caliber, Battle Mode Music, Made Up of Biff and Astro, Ness Yubinsky and Nuzzle respectively, Danny Pryor, aka Diamond Machine, Jay Doherty, aka MC Face Palm, The Mount Vernon Kid, Chavez Slovakia, Shinya Arino, Koji Garashi, Shigeru Miyamoto and Reggie Fizame from Nintendo, Sniper Wolf, Tim Rogers from Action Button, Mike Levy from XVGM Radio, and dude, you haven't played this game? John Lester, aka Gamester81, and Josh Riggs from Riggs Games. With these out of our skulls, as per usual, onto this game's main premise. A mysterious alien like being by the name of Mabu has appeared within the Big Apple, obviously New York, in 68, and has been considered a savior for his good deeds over time. In spite of that fact, however, it turns out that he's actually the leader of a secret fucking organization known as Geldra, whose overall intent is nothing more than, drumroll please, <laughs> fucking world domination. Of course, yeah, as if we're going there today. Two agents acting as part of the title espionage unit, Rolling Thunder, on behalf of the World Criminal Police Organization, instantly got wind of this, resulting in the following. The first agent, Layla Blitz, was sent to Geldra's underground HQ to expose their nefarious conspiracy, but was eventually captured and tortured by those goddamn, shit-devouring, thinkless, heartless sons of bitches. Now the second, and their best agent, Albatross, is out to do the same, in other words, seize Geldra's bullshit-as-fuck treachery, and rescue Layla's seductive yet deadly ass. In terms of gameplay, it's an espionage-themed action platforming running gun. Coco 13 anyone? Complete with some surprisingly ominous 007 Bond vibes up the ass, within which you're put in control of Agent Albatross, infiltrating the underground HQ of Geldra, made up of those goddamn multicolored KKK wannabe maskers, some unarmed, in which case they'll occasionally punch at close range, others with pistols like yours, and even those that continuously throw grenades no matter where the hell you are, in which case you have to make every effort to avoid the shit out of their detonations, and even those that warp out of nowhere like ninjas, hence their alias, and other perilous adversaries and threats. In terms of control, the D-pad forces Albatross to haul ass wherever, not to mention duck for defense and such, and while, as many may expect, B and A are for busting caps using a startup pistol or his alternate submachine gun upon entering one of the two ammo doors and jumping individually, he can also leap to higher sections using up and A simultaneously and back down with or without any railings using down and A simultaneously. Whenever you run out of normal pistol bullets, you're stuck with a slow-ass dud of one of them, which regenerates when that one shot hits an enemy or leaves the view entirely, in which case, always reload often and don't waste too much ammo. I'm looking at you, lethal enforcers. You can't shoot me. Reload. In addition, when scoring the submachine gun, use your ammo very sparingly, especially against the swarm of not only the multicolored maskers, but also panthers, the mutant bats referred to as gelzos, yellow beasts with red slacks referred to as blogas, and even the fucking lava men, aka what I'm affectionately referring to as the pyro piss ants, most of which will flat out make you their bottom bitch and not even think twice. 
Speaking of, you're given a two-hit health meter. In which other case, should you happen to collide into any enemy physically, twice, consider yourself fucked beyond thoughts and words. Ditto if you take a single slug, or to sound more refined, a bullet, or get exposed to any hazards, or even worse, run out of time. Getting back to the doors, entered via up, and exited upon releasing, while a few of them are for reloading ammo for both your pistol and occasional submachine gun, with a few rare-ass doors containing an emergency energy refill, others are mostly for taking temporary cover from any and all enemy activity, and also serve as spawn points for those goddamn motherfucking cloaked discount KKK masker douches. Upon clearing each area, of which there's ten by the way, split into two stories, distressing cutscenes of Layla's torment at the hands of the asshole enemies are displayed, with the exception of the fifth, where Mabu just pops up laughing his repugnant ass off, just as he does between the demos, and get this, whom he'll also and finally be facing off against in the tenth area. The most common gripe many have raved about this game time and time again, amongst others, likewise for the next two sequels, of course, are how irritatingly restrictive the controls are, in spite of their initially straightforward purposes, mostly in terms of being unable to bust caps or change direction while jumping, resulting in the obvious likelihood of colliding into any random adversaries, or plummeting into any hazard including random flying bullets, lava pools, bottomless pits, or laser traps. Hence where my advice comes in. As redundant as the gameplay procedure and strategic arrangements tend to be, it honestly doesn't take much to acclimatize oneself with them. <laughs> Regarding Rolling Thunder's challenge, given everything I've been yammering on about so far, if you're expecting any casual or leisurely routines out of this game, go somewhere else, goddammit, cause it'll pummel your nuts deep into the fucking pavement! No, scratch that! It'll, it'll float your motherfucking throat, throat while it douses your ass in liquid nitrogen, nitrogen, crushes your nuts in a meat grinder, and then scurries off to rape your ex-wife like the heartless bastard it is! Oh, speaking of heartless bastards, the majority of every enemy against whom you'll stand your ground will do a hell of a lot more than guarantee your ass will never return in one piece. Ditto for the nerf-switching hazards the second story offers on top of the more resilient variations of the aforementioned enemy droves, some of which involve hallways surrounded and barricaded by random as boss cages, and automated ceiling lasers that'll go off regardless of whether or not you're within their direct proximity, in which case precise, dead-on evasion timing is crucial as fuck. And since we're on that subject, balancing your tactics in terms of evasion between multiple heights and depths in every fucking chamber of the Gelder Organization's HQ, and busting caps first and asking questions later while conserving ammo is also mandatory for survival. Other than everything else, which, as per usual, I strongly suggest referring back to at this point, starting off with two lives and at least four continues, you're also offered a seven-digit number-based password system, but only when you die during the third, fifth, seventh, and ninth areas, and these passwords can be jotted down for future reference, or of course you can look them up on the web, because the future! Either way, please take every helpful hint I've advised into account, unless you enjoy being savagely fucking annihilated time and time again like Kenny McCormick from South Park. But then again, who does? <laughs> Graphics-wise, in direct comparison to its original arcade parent, the overall presentation, in terms of the stage background designs, the sprites of the participating characters, effects, post-stage cutscenes and the like, is represented magnificently here, given the console's limitations at the time. Granted, there wasn't a substantial enough deal of effort applied in supporting the entire game, including but not limited to all the redundant, albeit distinctive, Retro Spy-style backgrounds, no less. Thanks to a pre-Guilty Gear and Blaze Blue Arc System Works, who was also responsible for developing Capcom's one and only Rolling Thunder clone, codenamed Viper. <laughs> and Kyoidu Sentai Jew Ranger, which for the record was the basis for Saban's American Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, for Bandai's also ill-fated Angel imprint, but at least it shits dramatically on those half-assed European computer ports by Teartex. Agent Albatross by himself isn't too shabby, given his surprisingly tall stature as opposed to the majority of every adversary he subdues, not to mention his effortless and overdramatic animations for all his key physical actions. While the aforementioned cast of adversaries seem askew and out of place, particularly the multicolored maskers and the Gelzo mutant bats, palette choice wise, at least they're also represented decently here and then some. And the less I describe about those infamous post stage torture cutscenes featuring Layla, and even that reigning emperor of cock sucking bastard trolls, Mabu, the batter. I mean, for fuck's sake, man, must they go on any goddamn further?
In terms of music and sound, arranged by Junko Ozawa, with Minoru Kidoka serving as the sound driver, based on her original arcade compositions, and for more info on her, refer to my Tower of Dragon review from last season, number 64. Most of the familiar themes make their bizarrely triumphant return here in spades, despite the unsettling, eerie as hell instrumentation approaches being considered for the US-only Tengen version, as opposed to the more refined composition for the Japanese counterpart, thanks to Namco's special N163 chip. Either way, every theme's at least tolerable, albeit redundant, notwithstanding how often the participating sound effects tend to clash with them. Also, who could forget that earlier recounted digitized laugh from Abu during the demos and at the end of the fifth area, rivaling even those in Kung Fu, Zelda 2, and Punch Outs? <laughs> Regarding the replayability, due entirely to the intense, non-stop, stealthy standoffs that this game and the next two outings up for deliberation will provide every goddamn step of the way, and as long as you're capable enough of getting around the aforementioned controller-related restrictions and audio-visual limitations, and most importantly, improving your overall accuracy, evasion-wise and attack-wise, it's no deep dark secret that you'll be continuously traipsing back for more with the ass-kicking, espionage-themed arcade action of Namco Bandai's Rolling Thunder. Yeah! Exhibits B and C individually, Rolling Thunder 2 and 3 both of the Genesis, circa 1991 and 93. While the former is a direct port of its original 1990 arcade counterpart, the latter is a console-only exclusive, released only here in the US and not anywhere else, despite being developed in Japan alongside Namco by Now Production of Yonoid and Dragon Spirit fame. anything less than this. Just like every well-known franchise, whether still in existence, long since abandoned, or just resurrected from dick all after god knows how long, two potential 16-bit updates wouldn't be too far behind. Anyhow, in Rolling Thunder 2's case, picking up right where the previous offering left off, just when we thought Geldra's chaotic horseshit actions would somehow meet their end, holy fuck how wrong we'd be! Less than three decades later, the very same psychotic-ass rival organization from last time, currently resurrected under the appointed leadership of the arms merchant-slash-mastermind Gimdo, has managed to start even more shit by totaling every satellite in outer space sent from all over the globe, causing all sorts of confusion among the masses. Who else but WCPO's most experienced is back to counter their insanity, not just Albatross himself this time, but also Layla alongside him, and no longer a motherfucking captive, I might add. Though, according to some sources, the two agents are a completely different duo, inheriting the same codenames and looks or prowesses. And in the case of Rolling Thunder 3, yet again, continuing with the mythos of the WCPO's legacy, while Albatross and Layla are away dealing with the investigation of Gendo's continuing actions, a new Rolling Thunder agent is introduced, Jay, snooze to the nooch, nope, not that Jay, assigned with a mission of his own. What's his latest mission in question, you might ask? To track down and eliminate Geldra's second-in-command, Dread, who, not surprisingly, resembles that very same bastard Mabu, and their never-ending cronies stationed not only in Las Vegas, but in other familiar nearby locales, a few including California and Chile and South America, with the help of communications officer Ellen.
Gameplay wise, once again, who would expect anything else other than the same non-stop espionage excitement with our two agents, whether solo, as either of them, or side by side, hence the two-player co-op feature. Not only do they both control the same as Albatross himself did, they're now immune to random enemy collisions, whether on ground or in mid-air, despite still taking a hit upon being knocked down by any masker. And since it's two Genesis games we're dealing with here, especially including this shit, the controls are about the same, except A does fuck all, B lets them fire the standard pistol and or the special sub weapons, and C lets them quote unquote leap for dear life, and you can even shift your jumping direction here unlike last time. Regarding the aforementioned special weapons, apart from the usual submachine gun, there's also the flamethrower, blazer, and five-way cluster gun, which also possess limited ammo like everything else. Your main energy bar can also be extended to four units upon entering the special doors, and up to five in Rolling Thunder 3. But the same damage punishments apply here, even if you take a goddamn bullet, or get exposed to any unforeseen fucking hazards. The main locales for each operation are as follows. In Miami, Florida, you're infiltrating an Oceanside Street, followed by the exterior path to Gimdo's Villa, within the villa itself, leading to an underground base, a two-part dome-shaped bio-research facility within said underground base, leading to the exterior section of Gimdo's attack submarine, Giza, Egypt, following the submarine's tracks past the Mediterranean Sea from Florida, hence the prior cutscene. The hunt really heats up in a five-part slew of investigations turned standoffs, leading all the way to Gelger's all-new hideout, complete with a fucking space shuttle, I might add. Enemy casting-wise, the maskers make their comeback, with much-deserved updates no less, and even those that take more than two hits, as do the random panthers and bats, mixed with a new batch of terrorists, including these scuba-like maskers capable of lobbing mines that roll across the ground, a radioactive masker with an electromagnetic field surrounding his ass, whom he can only attack from the rear for the record, and that's heavy-duty guards capable of taking cover near doors and are only vulnerable when they attack, and even the goddamn armadillo-like ground-burrowing, drill-arm-toting roach rollers, Thought some of the bosses here could be somehow forgiving? Consider yourself mistaken. A giant cyborg makes its appearance at the end of the second area near the villa entrance, and I'd watch its crosshair closely if I were you, because it'll turn your ass into a human barbecue, and so badly too you'd wish you died as a fucking child. The never-ending master marathon in the fifth area, during which they'll pop up from every door while a ceiling laser fires off randomly, reminiscent of Wing Fortress and the second act of Flying Battery in Sonic 2 and 3.5, that is Sonic and Knuckles, respectively. Four attack turrets, half installed on the ground, the other half installed on the ceiling, in the 8th area while an opposing crosshair targets your agent from out of fucking nowhere. Shit, Shinobi 3 anyone? And finally, a ruthless, not to be fucked with Gimdo himself appearing in two forms in the 11th and last area, showing off his almost unpredictable laser patterns. I'm looking at you, Fantasy Zone. Regarding the third entry, however, once more, everything's ditto like the first two. Please refer back to what I mentioned about the previous two Rolling Thunder titles, since I have no intention of reiterating every fucking detail. Upon the start of every Masker Extermination mission, you're given the choice of one of nine available alternate special weapons, specifically a full automatic machine gun, shotgun, laser, bazooka, cannon, and flamethrower, in addition to three types of explosives, the normal grenade, a flash grenade, and a cracker grenade, which in true strike gunner SDG fashion, are totally cancelled and restricted for the remainder of the game. In which other case, should you not select any of these, you're stuck with a close range knife. So if I were you, I'd maintain a reasonable ass mindset. The controls are about the same, except not only are you capable of firing your main pistol diagonally, upwards only of course, you're now also permitted to bust caps while jumping, though Codename Viper initiated that first, but I digress. Despite the fact that there's no time limit, unlike the previous two Rolling Thunder offerings, I wouldn't get too goddamn comfortable or fuck around too long anywhere, cause sooner or later, there will be a digitized vocal reminder of a spike in enemy activity, complete with a sniper crosshair out of nowhere to top it all off. In which case, HALT MAJOR ASS! Jay, this is HQ. Enemy attack increasing. Hurry up! I don't even need to point out that there's other enemies besides the maskers, including the cyborg tigers that behave and attack in the same manner as the panthers, let alone the cybernetic lady maskers that flip around and jump kick as if they were those infuriating ass blaze clones, Mona and Lisa, from Streets of Rage 1 and 3. Oh, and apart from playing as Jay, you can also play as Alan by answering a password at the start, which I'll reveal later, minus all the cutscenes. Itinerary-wise, you as Agent J, or his communicating assistant slash dispatcher, Ellen, start off at an oil refinery in California, its neighboring interior factory, a motorcycle ride, hence the first of two auto-scrolling areas, complete with an obstacle course and highway standoff against the maskers between California and Nevada, 
The streets of Las Vegas, Dred's Vegas Mansion, another auto scrolling mobile standoff, except involving a jet ski across the Pacific Ocean, Easter Island Rapa Nui, in Chile, of course, whether during the daytime or at night, depending on which difficulty mode you're playing on, Dred's underwater base, aboard a homeward plane, attempting to foil a hijack plot, and finally, Dred's Castle. In terms of boss standoffs, a red attack mecha, aka Tachikoma's long lost stepsister, goes all out in the second area, a security cyber centaur in the seventh area, and lastly, Dread himself in both the eighth and tenth areas. Welcome, Jay. Guarded by both a row of ceiling turrets and housed within a motherfucking mechanical ass menace, respectively. Compared to their predecessor, these two follow-ups we're looking at here are at the very least fair in that you're given a hell of a lot more free reign in every area to not only coast through every scene while taking advantage of the main agent's customary and newly introduced abilities alike. But make no god fucking damn mistake, most of the adversaries are way more tenacious than you can imagine. Likewise, for every unforeseen peril that'll come your way, hence where the next subject is involved, of course. I don't even need to mention how slightly augmented the controls are, not to mention way less restrictive by comparison, in spite of how enthralling, yet at times monotonous and perplexing, the gameplay cycle is, among other features. While both Rolling Thunder 2 and 3 are on about the same fucking plateau as the previous outing, in terms of challenge of course, the third outing is at least a skosh more forgiving as opposed to 2, in that most of the enemies you face have ways of instantly retaliating against you without any ounce of hesitation whatsoever, for instance, ducking to fire, lobbing more than one grenade all at once, respawning near your agents out of nowhere more often than not, and what's more, they'll do much more than tempt you to set your goddamn controller ablaze while ramming your bare skull against a concrete wall and drinking endless gallons of doers mixed with Ryan Jeremy's skull sample, castor oil, and the infamous dip from Roger Rabbit. The keenest senses and intellect are crucial in both installments, especially during the cover and fire standoffs against most of the opposing, cock-knocking, shit-for-brains, pendejo, asswipe terrorists, not just ducking behind crates, but also hiding behind doors to evade every incoming attack. And if you're able to recall my other hints regarding the conservation of ammo, the same strongly applies with more than just the introductory pistol and the occasional submachine gun. I wouldn't get too fucking stingy or extra with the new special weapons either, cause all you'll be stuck with is the close range knife if you run out. Well, in Rolling Thunder 3's case anyway. Even if, once again, you decided not to take any of the 9 sub weapons. And when it comes to the diagonal upward firing, you're only allowed to do so with your main pistol, but not any of the six projectile non-explosive sub weapons. Like seriously, Namco Bandai, what kind of shit is this? Starting out with at least two lives, more of which are awarded by racking up points like before, and depending on which offering you're experimenting with, zero and three continues respectively. You're also given two types of password systems for possible continuation opportunities: a code word jumbling system in Rolling Thunder 2, composed of four conjunctions, one of eight possible adjectives, nouns verbs, and other adjacent nouns, forming a possible, if rather nonsensical, sentence, and the cliché-ass single-letter system in Rolling Thunder 3, but only five characters are required. And speaking of which, getting back to playing as Ellen, just type in greed, nothing to it. You got it. Anyhow, don't become too extremely agitated or dismayed should any vehement, overwhelming in-game juncture happen to send your ass over the edge, if much more so than, say, being asked for change or smokes by one random bum after another every day, and being forced to repeat the same goddamn road test upon receiving every second-rate or third-rate results rolled into one. Anyways, all shocking metaphors aside... Graphically, do I even need to elaborate further on how much the presentations evolved from their ancestor regarding both games? They've both received major and more than well-deserved facelifts by comparison, and then some, despite most of the second game's introductory stills lacking any extra animated elements other than the supporting text underneath, detailing each mission briefing and or correlating plot point, of course. Most of the areas in which each and every mission takes place may not resemble their real-life counterparts, but at least Namco, aka Bandai Namco now, did their absolute motherfucking best, likewise for the main agents themselves. Albatross and Layla in 2, not to mention their brief opening cutscene cameo in 3, have maintained rather respectable personas, especially in-game, likewise for Jay and his assistant Ellen. As unimpressive and tedious as the new enemies are after a given deal of time, at least the adventures weren't complete without them. And the less I say about the impending as shit end bosses, who of course make Sergeant Major Dickerson from Good Morning Vietnam and the Queen from the Alien franchise look like BJ and the Bear, by the way, the better. 
Regarding the cutscenes in Rolling Thunder 3, as dated as they are, at least there's more animated elements. In terms of the traveling chopper over Vegas at the start, the projector running during Jay's target briefing, and every participating character's close-up shots when they deliver their respective lines, which for the record are convincing to say the absolute least. Understatement, yes, but shit, let's just fucking move on already. <laughs> Music and sound-wise, orchestrated by Shiba, based on the second game's original arcade compositions by a pre-ridge racer, Ayako Sasso, also of Galaxian 3, Project Dragoon, Sokoban DX, and Street Fighter EX fame, with two undisclosed composers under the aliases of Rose and Dick Boy, God knows whoever the fuck they're supposed to be, handling the console-exclusive third offering, the all-new collection of themes for both outings don't disappoint by any means whatsoever. Many can say what the fuck they want about them, but each possess their undeniably hip, upbeat, techno-espionage flair, rivaling even Duran Duran, AHA, Depeche Mode, and others, meshed with some epic orchestral overtones, rivaling the likes of John Williams, Alan Silvestri, Danny Elfman, Hans Zimmer, David and Thomas Newman, and the like, befitting the vibes of every participating in-game event in more ways than one could possibly grasp. The correlating sound effects could have used the tad more polish, especially the voiceovers when every adversary meets their end. Ditto for the main agents when they get their asses accidentally wasted, but are at least appropriate enough considering the 16-bit hardware they're made for. And take note of my top 10 songs displayed here for both games. Did I mention here? In terms of replayability, it's obvious why, considering this particular franchise hasn't been discussed or raved about very often lately, except through some select sources, these two latest installments have so much to offer as opposed to their landmark predecessor, which I'm in no position to recap at this juncture. Also, this is where I regretfully forgot to mention one key detail, apart from everything I've been raving about so far. Just like the previous Rolling Thunder game, there are also passwords provided for the second quest for both titles, meaning a much tougher and more strenuous path by comparison. Fuck, Zelda, Ghosts and Goblins, G.I. Joe, and Low G-Man much? Either way, if you're starving for more spy-themed suspense and adventure, putting even Cody Banks and the Cortez siblings, Junie and Carmen from Spy Kids, to absolute irreversible contempt, you'd be non compass mentis like a motherfucker to pass up Rolling Thunder 2 and 3. Henceforth, in summation, my final verdict on Rolling Thunder, words alone cannot express how much this franchise has been resonating with me, ever since scoping out the arcade machine of the original decades back, at various amusement parks, restaurants, bars, and various recreational facilities. I'm looking at you, Fun Spot in Laconia. In spite of not being highly revered as the earlier reference Shinobi, not to mention Contra, Ghost and Goblins, Ninja Gaiden, Altered Beast, you name it, mostly in terms of the overly demanding attention, mastery, and precision they deserve. But nothing, absolutely fucking nothing comes close to the Rolling Thunder trilogy. Seriously, as tense, unhinged, brutal, and extremely nerve-twitching as the difficulty levels can be, even those won't deter you much from experiencing what Namco's criminally underrated spy-centric franchise is all about, and then some, which also paved the way for Time Crisis for the record. With the exception of Rolling Thunder 3, the latter of which never saw any future re-releases, at least the first two, specifically the arcade originals, are featured on a few Namco Museum collections, with some slight, if rather unappealing, technical modifications, but I humbly digress. So what are you waiting for? The release of the next Daniel Craig Bond film? Make every effort to track down all three of them, even if you have to go the alternate online shopping route, and pricing-wise, they're definitely worth every buck and then some. Speaking of which, please refer to the following totals displayed, depending on condition for each individual title.
out with these squared away. Until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God proudly signing off. <laughs>